Welcome back to another edition of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum podcast. Today, we're visiting with Linda Mitchell Davis, a respected board member of the museum and a lifelong rancher. Join us now as Linda unveils her ranching history and tells us all about the Western art she grew up with. Welcome back again for another National Cowboy Museum podcast. And this is one of my favorite weekends of the year, the Western Heritage Awards. And tonight, we have a great lady with us, Linda Mitchell Davis from Cimarron, New Mexico. Linda, it's great to have you back again to the National Cowboy Museum. Your home in Oklahoma. It certainly is. It has been, I've been on the board now for, I guess it's uh, 23 years, something like that. I went on the board in 1988. Mrs. Davis, you've been a friend of the museum for a long time, since your father was one of the first board members here at the museum. But today you received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Annie Oakley Society. That must have been pretty exciting. Well, today has been a very, very special day. Um, I, this, this whole hall here, uh, the museum is very close to my heart and has been uh, ever since uh, the very beginning when uh, Chester Reynolds uh, came up with the idea and asked my dad if he would assemble a group uh, in Denver at stock show time in January of 1956. And uh, my dad, of course, was a legendary rancher from and back uh, probably the Mr. Cattleman of the last century. And he knew, had lots of connections, and the group that met in Denver was the governors of the 17 western states and one cattleman representing each state. And uh, they assembled at the Brown Palace and had the initial meeting. And uh, Chester Reynolds presented his idea to these gentlemen and said, we've got to preserve this heritage. He said, it's the backbone of America. And uh, they all agreed and uh, within six weeks, or a short amount of time, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Reynolds had a fatal heart attack. And uh, my dad had been elected the vice chair of the group, and he assumed the chairmanship, and uh, was literally, when we became a, uh, a museum, when the building was, a, and he was the first chairman for a number of years. And uh, I've it's sort of been in the family. I took the notes and helped arrange for that first meeting. And my brother was on the board for a number of years. And after he passed away, the board asked me if I'd uh, become a member of the board. So it's been one of the delights of my life. And uh, probably because of a deep, love for good Western art is what started it. And that includes paintings, uh, drawings, um, uh, the bronzes, and uh, anything that, that my dad, uh, when he went, he went to Cornell. He graduated from Cornell in 1917. In the war class, they gra didn't have a graduation. They kicked them all out in April and they all went to war. And uh, he had, when he went back east to Cornell, they suggested that they bring something with them that reflects home or reminds them of home. And he got, of course, everything was on the railroad in those days. He was on the train, got on the train in Raton, New Mexico, and got to Kansas City and got off and went in the gift shop there. And there were two little eight by 10 pictures. One of them was in from the night herd and the other one was the fatal loop. So he tracked those two paintings down and began his collection with that Remington and that Russell. And I remember, you know, back in the 30s when times were pretty tough. We had the Dust Bowl and we had the drought of the 30s and the depression and 
and he was always trying to find where some of these good paintings were and he had a, a collection of friends that were very interested in the same way and I I think that's how so I remember in the dining room uh, in from the night herd was over the sideboard at the ranch there at Tekeskeet and uh, over my dad's desk was the Fatal Loop and he loved that one. I mean he just thought that was one of the greatest paintings he'd ever seen. Of all of the collection that he had, I think my favorite Remington, you see right over my shoulder, the Remington that was painted to illustrate an article that was written to explain the cavalry horses, an enlisted man's horse and an officer's horse and the contrast in it. And I love that, the, the black and white that's hanging behind here. That, that was always one of my favorites probably my favorite of the Remingtons. How did the collection come to be here? Well, the Tekeskeet Ranch is 80 miles from the nearest uh, town. There's no fire protection, no, uh, I mean, you know, it was, it was a collection that he had accumulated during, uh, over a period of 25 years or so, and it became so valuable that you couldn't insure it. And so he uh, ended up uh, loaning it for a while to the Loveless uh, Foundation in Albuquerque. I mean, there was no way to keep people from marking with crayons on them or anything. It was a, and uh, by then, uh, the National Cowboy Museum was a going entity with the controlled atmosphere, the uh, security and the things that you need and the fact that it was millions of people could see it and that was what my dad wanted and along with Joel McRae who was a very very close friend of my dad's and the two of them were Joel was the California rep you know that started that and and the two of them were very good friends and had much the same ta uh, tastes in, in Western art and all he, and he and Joel McCrave both felt very much that was the, the way they wanted. They wanted the true thing, the real, the real thing, not, you know, that depicted the way it was when it was real. As one of the founding members of the Annie Oakley Society, could you tell us a little bit about the organization and its goals? The goals of the Annie Oakley uh, Society are to enhance the education opportunities for the young people that come here. And this, as uh, Chester Reynolds, one of the goals that he had in mind was for the young people, ed an education of the we true West and some of the standards and ideals, some of the cowboy vision. And, and he really felt that to keep a museum of this size and quality going, you had to educate the young people so that you would have, they would always be interested. And that, I can kind of illustrate that with my life because that's what got me interested, was being raised with some of this great Western art that was in our home. And uh, I think that's true of every lady that was there today and today was so enhanced by the fact that we had a pioneer lady with us, Sandra Day O'Connor, who has a ranching background from southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico. Their ranch was uh, saddled the, the state line there. And uh, she, and that's, that's tough ranching country. I would imagine. <laughs> well, I was also going to ask you, let you segue into this, Attending school on that remote New Mexican ranch must have been a challenge. It was a group of cowboys. This was before the Second World War. It was a group of young men, most of them single, and they couldn't have been more wonderful to me. And just took me under their wing and I'd ride with them and be with them a day and we'd camp out and stay with the crew. And the in the evenings, We'd try and read a little bit, or somebody sometimes had a harmonica or a fiddle, and we'd sing a little bit. 
but uh, the tradition on the bell wagon was everybody that had a bedroll took a copy of Ranch Romances with them. Ranch Romance was a like a funny book, paper magazine, little thin paper magazine, and uh, would roll up in your bedroll, and, and it wouldn't increase the weight of your bed because everybody's bed roll, the Mark Woods, the wagon boss, would weigh it before when we left in the spring. If he could pick it up without straining, it would, if, you, if he had to strain, you had to kick something out of your bedroll. So at any rate, everybody, and we'd pass these around. Well, I had my copy of Peter Rabbit with me, and I was so proud of my Beatrice Potter Peter Rabbit. And so I'd get them to read that. Well, they got pretty darn tired of Peter Rabbit. <laughs> and so the print was large, and it was nice, you know, there was never any swearing, never any bad language, never, it was always the cowboy was the hero and he won the lady. And it was, they taught me to read. And by the time I got to first grade, I could read anything and I was so bored with, you know, here comes Jane, see Dick. And so I, I really, I was homeschooled through the sixth grade uh, on the on the ranch, I would go back and forth between the Tecuskeet Ranch, which was neighboring to the Bell, and uh, my dad had a governess that uh, homeschooled my brothers and I. And then when the war started, uh, we went for a few years to a school in Albuquerque that would let us go to school four days a week and punch cows the other three days a week. And uh, I did a lot of work, uh, day work, uh, in Albuquerque on either side of the Rio Grande there, because um, I, you know, I could, I could pen cattle, I could work cattle, and during the war years, it was the, the kids and the women, and the older men, that kept the ranches going, and we were all in the business to produce beef for the military. To put all this in perspective, your daughter Julia said that a sense of responsibility for the ranch is truly important to your family. Well, I, th I think that I'm a fourth generation rancher and uh, with the uh, arrival of my first great grandchild, now I guess we have seven generations that, that are. And uh, these family ranches are the backbone of the ranching industry. The old time, the people of today, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's getting harder and it's more of a struggle for them because we're at the mercy of Mother Nature and, uh, and at the mercy of, of the country that you're ranching in because uh, if you ranch in Mississippi, it's a lot different from ranching in Arizona or New Mexico or Idaho or Nevada and places like that. And, um, I think it's, it's people that have, for generations, been dedicated to the land. And that's, the, the, we get our, uh, our, our living, we make by harvesting the grass that's on our land through the beef animal. And the bovine animal is what, in our drought areas, our areas that get, uh, uh, brain that's unsatisfactory in, in, in a pattern that's unsatisfactory. It's the hoof action that works the seed into the ground and, the, and most of the range grasses in, in the Great Plains are, will clump if they aren't grazed. And so you've got to keep animals on the land to keep the arid. Otherwise, the seeds would blow away if you didn't have, have you know, we have wind and we, we and uh, uh, moisture that, that uh, has no satisfactory schedule. And I think that that's probably, you're, you, you're so steeped in it and you've done it always and have for generations and, and it's, uh, we, we can't conceive of living any other way. If you're planning a trip to Oklahoma City, be sure to visit the National Cowboy Museum. You'll be able to view the incomparable collection of 21 works of art by Frederick Remington and Charlie Russell. The artwork was donated by the family of Linda Mitchell Davis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.